We have so far been looking at calculus of exponential and logarithmic functions. You can see them all over the board. But you might be able to guess by looking at this piece of paper that you've got in front of you that we're going to kind of push past those exponential and logarithmic functions. It's not labeled, but what kind of a function is this? Yeah, go ahead, Dane. This is sine x, right? Not exponential, it's not logarithmic. What bigger family of functions does sine x belong to? Starts with a T, Keegan? Yeah, trigonometric functions, right? So there's sine, there's cos, there's tan. This whole big fan, and then there's like reciprocals. There's, does anyone remember what the reciprocals are, by the way? It's like sec, cosec, and cot, right? These, this is like a whole big world out there. Much like once we learn exponentials and logs, you're like, oh, now I have all these different things to play with. It's going to be the same deal with trigonometric functions. Now, some of you, if you're like me, you're like, I'm slightly nervous <laughs> sort of walking into this big world. But I kind of want to hopefully get you excited about this because I want you to feel the feeling that mathema mathematicians do when they're inventing mathematics. Actually, I, I sat down prematurely. I just put your pens down for a second. I just want to say something really important to you. Um, I'm going to preface what I'm about to say with a very important statement that you might think is not true, except I'm pointing it out very obviously. I really love science. I think it's one of the most amazing subjects you guys have the opportunity to study. I wish I had studied more of it when I was at high school. However, one of the things that really frustrates me, I don't know if, how many of you do A science? Any science? All of you? Except for you of us. And, oh no, no, sorry, two of you. Okay. I just dropped. You just, <laughs> I just dropped physics. Um, RIP, that's okay. Thanks, Sansa. Um, actually, unlike you guys, I didn't do any physics in years 11 and 12, not because I didn't like it, but because I just didn't have, like I did 14 units, is already too many, okay? Now, despite that, I love science, but the thing that always frustrated me was, and I don't know if this is your feeling either, is that what you do in science is often very different from what scientists actually do. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. What you do in science is often very different from what scientists do, because they're busy like researching, trying to like discover new stuff, and what you guys mostly do is actually the opposite of that. You study and learn the stuff that's already been discovered by somebody else. Does that make sense? So like you do some experiments and you try to, you know, like go through the same kind of scientific process and so on, and that's like thumbs up. However, it's not like any of you are like fiddling with radioactive substances for the first time and accidentally making your diaries radioactive for the next 300 years like Marie Curie did. You're just kind of like following in her footsteps, thankfully, safety and all that, but you're not actually doing science the way that a scientist does. Does that make sense? Okay. Now maths, I get it, sometimes feels the same way. Like these rules, we kind of showed you how they work, but for the most part, you're following what someone else did. But I kind of want to blow the lid off that with this. This is, as Daniel pointed out, and we should actually label it as such, this is y equals sine x. Maybe you want to put it over here on the right-hand side. y equals sine x. And uh, sine x is, I guess you could call it like the primordial trigonometric function. Every other trigonometric function gets its definition from sine x. And actually you kind of maybe already knew that in the back of your mind, if you could tell me, like you all did, what the names of the other functions are. For example, cos x, right? Do you guys know? It's an abbreviation. What's an abbreviation, what's cos an abbreviation for? Yeah, cosine, right? Cosine. So clearly, even just from the name, cosine takes its definition from sine. Um, does anyone know what the co stands for, by the way? It's also an abbreviation. It, it stands for complement, right? Which we will get back to later on. It has to do with angles that add up to 90 degrees, okay? So you've got the complement of sine. Uh, what's the other main trigonometric function you guys know about? It's, starts with a T. It's tan, right? Or, which is also short for tangent, but this is like, are you getting a sense? Like mathematicians so lazy, we abbreviate everything. Tan is an abbreviation for a fraction. What's the fraction? It's sine over cos. So you can see it's like there's sine again, and I'll just write it in long form just to make it really obvious. There's sine again, right? So if you understand sine, you understand everything in trigonometry. So that's why I've just given you the one graph, and we're going to try and unpack what is the derivative of this, right? Now, some of you know an answer to this question already, but I separate that from do you understand why? 
Do you understand how it is that you can get the derivative for this, the result, the formula? We've been using formulas all morning. They're great because they're fast, but they are no substitute. A formula is no substitute for really knowing why something is the way that it is. So, I said right at the beginning, um, I would love you to get a ruler out if you've got one. Can you just wave it around at me in the S if you've got one, just so I can see how many of you have one, okay? If you've got a straight edge, that's better than nothing. Thank you, hands down. But the ruler actually will be useful, okay? Now, I want you to remember, and maybe you want to do this actually just, um, just underneath, uh, or in your book perhaps is the best way to put it. We've had a look at different functions, like say, why'd I do it like that? Like say the exponential function, draw me another quick and dirty exponential function, like so. And also, we've had a look at the log function, and we've said, you can actually understand a lot about the derivatives of these without any symbols, without any algebra, just by looking at the geometry, the shape, the visual of it, right? For example, we all notice that the derivative of an exponential, the gradient of an exponential looks like an exponential. It starts low and positive and it becomes big and positive, right? And that's exactly what an exponential function does. In much the same way, though, we got a very different result. When you look at the log, right, do you remember what we said? It's positive, but instead of going from a low gradient to a high gradient, it goes from a high, like a steep gradient, to a shallow gradient, from high gradient to low. So therefore, we ended up with, do you remember? This curve here, what was its equation? Do you remember? If we start with y equals log x, I mean, you've written it on the board, right? 1 over x, very good, so dy on dx, it's this um, familiar hyperbola, right, at least one part of it, okay? Now we want to go through this same kind of visual exercise to try and develop intuition for what's going on with the trigonometric curve. But as you can see, it's not nearly as simple as the exponential or the log. You can't say, oh, it just like starts low and goes up. It like does this weird waving around thing, right? Um, it repeats. By the way, we have a special name for when a function repeats itself over and over again. It starts with a P, does anyone remember what it is? Periodic, periodic. fantastic. So the periodicity, the periodicity of this function is weird, but also means if we can just understand a small section of it, then we just take that understanding and just copy it over and over again. Every period it will look the same, which is why you can notice off the end here, right? Uh, you can see this value here. I've kind of just left it off like after that because it's just going to be the same over and over again. Okay, now the last thing to note is um, there's a weird scale going on with this and I'm not going to fully explain in too much detail, but these aren't degrees, aren't they? Does anyone know what this scale is? Because you'd expect that to be 180 degrees. Does anyone know what it is? Daniel. These are radians, right? In fact, go ahead and um, label this for me right there in the middle. Have I moved my thing? No, I haven't. Right there in the middle there, that's an important number in radians. You might be able to guess it just by looking at the scale. It's just a bit after three. What's the important number just after three in radians? It's pi, it's pi right? So there's pi. If we went a little bit further over, you can see this number that's just after six to give us the full copy of the trigonometric curve. It's not pi, it's two pi, fantastic. So this is a horizontal scale in radians and that's essential because what we're gonna now do, and I'm gonna give you two examples of this and then I'm gonna ask you to do it for the rest of the curve. We're gonna try and understand not just like roughly what does the derivative look like, we actually wanna measure the thing, okay? So let's zoom in real close and have a look at what's going on in the left hand corner. Okay, and do you remember when we were having a look at the exponential log curves, we started putting tangents on those curves and we said, hey, look at what the gradient looks like, right? So at each of these points, you could draw a teeny little tangent. And what I'm gonna do is ask you to do that for a few of the locations which you're gonna choose on the graph. But I will give you the first one for free because I'm just nice like that, okay? Let's start from x equals zero. Go ahead and take your ruler now, right? And I want you to, uh, to place it, align it with the graph so that you end up with a tangent. I hope you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, let me, there we go. Do you get something roughly like that? That hopefully is where your ruler looks like. I'm just trying to mimic it because I don't have a ruler to put on the screen, okay? Now once you've got the, that ruler in place, oopsie daisy, I actually want you to go ahead and draw 
part of that tangent. You don't want to draw too much because we're going to draw a bunch of these, okay? Maybe this would be enough. I would say something like that. Let me make this a bit thicker so you can see it more clearly. Hopefully you can see that. Oops, it is. All right. So here's my tangent, okay? Now, to measure the gradient of something, you just need two things on a straight line. You need its rise and you need its run. Yeah, rise over run gives you gradient. So therefore, along with this tangent, what I'd like you to draw, and I'll do this dotted so that it's not gonna cloud my diagram too much. Go ahead and draw a rise and run for that little tangent. So you can see I'm gonna get this right angled triangle in here, okay? Now I said, a rule will be really helpful because what I'm gonna ask you to do now is to actually measure what those two things are. Like, how tall is this thing? What is this height? And what is this width? What are the rise and what are the run? And as we've seen and just sort of stated, right? Gradient is rise over run. Now, because this is a really easy one, you actually might be able to even use the scale of this to see, right? Have a look at my scale that I've provided to you. If this is one, how big is each of these little squares? Well, how, how wide is each one? 0.2, yeah? So let's go ahead and we'll actually write this on here. 0.2 is pretty much how high it goes. And 0.2 is basically how wide it is, okay? So in this case, gradient rise over run will be 0.2 over 0.2, which is... We can do 0.2 over 0.2, even though you just had a weekend of no maths. It's one, right? Okay, gradient equals one for this particular tangent. Now, I'm gonna sort of scaffold a little bit, but I'm not gonna tell you the answer. Find a different spot, anywhere you like. And I'd really love it actually if you picked different spots to the people around you. Like, you don't have to all do the same spot. But if, for instance, let me just temporarily move this out of the way. I'll put it back in a second, but let's pick a spot like, say, here. This is a bit random, right? But I'm gonna do the same thing and I'm gonna place my ruler up against this and try and measure a gradient, okay? So it looks to me, if I were to draw that tangent across, it would be something like this. Does that look pretty? Oh, I can do better than that, I reckon. I reckon it's gonna be a bit more like that. Does that look pretty tangential to you? Zoomed out unintentionally. Okay, now, at the same, in the same way, I can draw on my little triangle, right? I keep on zooming out by accident because my pen is too uncoordinated. So I'm gonna draw a really nice thick line across here, like so. And I'm gonna do the same, rise and run. Now you have to be, you have to be as precise as you can, better than what I've done, right? But you're gonna measure these same things, right? Here and here. And I'm gonna be able to work out whatever this rise is divided by whatever this run is and that will give me a new gradient but i can already see even just by eyeballing it that if i compare that to this one here it's going to be a little bit keep doing that it's going to be a little shallower do you agree one last one and i'm not going to tell you the answer but hopefully you can see it once you get to a spot like say that's going to drive me crazy this spot here Without even drawing a triangle, you might be able to tell me what the gradient is at that point, and you can write there, gradient equals whatever you think it actually equals. So, I'm gonna pause there. You guys have your rulers, you've got hopefully some colors might help you in that kind of thing. Find six, seven, eight points, and then once you've got a bunch of gradients, we're actually gonna plot those on and see what they make, okay? Off you go.